Um, I wanted to confess to you something that I brought up in the Christmas Day sermon uh, or message uh, just just a couple weeks ago, and that is I like fire. Uh, this is not new to those who have been here for some time. We've had fire tornadoes. We've had other things. I like starting fires. Now, that was nurtured at a young age as I was brought into Boy Scouts, and I was taught how important it was that to, for, to survive that you needed to be able to start a fire, and you needed to be able to do it well and do it in all kinds of conditions. If you're a Boy Scout or you went camping a lot, maybe a Girl Scout, you know that you were supposed to light a, a fire with what? One match. Now, sometimes on my worst days, this is my one match uh, right there. That'll, you know, I, and, and I will tell you that during the, um, the Pentecost, d- sorry, during the, the pandemic, during COVID pandemic, I was given a gift by my wife of a solo stove. Do you know what those are? Yeah, it's a fire pit and it helps you like it, it burns all the wood in it. It's supposed to be smokeless, nothing smokeless, but nevertheless, it's it has less smoke and you can really burn everything without having to go through so much wood. It's a great gift. And I enjoy lighting that fire, sitting out there, meditating on God's word, thinking, processing the day, uh, considering my thoughts, looking to the fire and just relaxing. And, and every once in a while, I try to light the fire in, a, in the ways I was taught. Um, And so I have some fire lighting tools for you here today. I don't know if you've ever lit a fire like this, but this is called the flint and steel. Um, And if you, yeah, I got a spike right away. If you hit it just right, you can get sparks off it. This is not the easiest way to light the fire. My favorite way, because we're talking about lighting fires today, is with the ferro rod. I don't know if you've seen these before. If you've watched Survivor, you've watched people use these over and over again. And it's just got a a metal rod, a a magnesium rod, and then some steel. And if you hit it right, you can really get the the sparks going. I like this other side here. After church, I had multiple people asking to borrow and utilize this. And I let too many, too many people do so. And now it's, oh, there we go. It's really, it's really going now. I love the idea of the spark, that little thing. And and if you catch it just right and you put it into a, a bundle of, a fiber or maybe some paper, and you lift it up and you blow on it, and it can fan into a flame. And that little tiny spark can fan into the flame, and it can bring warmth, uh, protection, the ability to, to provide food for yourself, all kinds of things the fire enables. It's no surprise then, throughout the scriptures, fire is used as a symbol of God's presence and of God's power, of God's judgment and God's purification. It's a symbol of faith. It's not the only symbol of our faith, but it's an important one found throughout the scriptures. We remember that Moses encounters God by a burning bush. We remember that, that Abraham, in fact, encounters the, the fire of the Lord. That, that, that Elijah goes away in a, a fiery chariot. We have all these different the, the people of Israel led through the wilderness with a pillar of fire. There's this illustration over and over again. Today, uh, we are celebrating the season of Epiphany. Now, our Catholic and our Episcopalian and Lutheran brothers and sisters in Christ, they're all going, no, Matthew, this is Baptism of the Lord Sunday. But see, Thursday was Epiphany. Thursday was Epiphany. So we're going to celebrate Epiphany this Sunday, and I enjoy it, and I love it. And it's the reminder of us that there is still that light in the darkness. That, that after Jesus was born, uh, that the Magi, these, these astrologers from the, from the east, probably from Iran, they saw that there was a new light, probably in the, in the constellation of Pisces, and they recognized that to be a symbol of a new king. And so they followed that light to the land that it represented, that was Israel. And then they went to the king, and they said, we hear there's a new king. There's a new light that has come. Congratulations! And he's not excited about this. But they go on their way to Bethlehem, and they find Jesus, now a child, now in a house. And they find him, and they give him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. The light is what shines, and it's what drew them to have an encounter with God. And so I want to talk to you today about a different story, a story about a pit. Uh, a pit life is the series that we're in, in which we have a revelation of what it looks like to, to believe in God, to be a follower of God, to trust God, and to build that notion of faith. It's, if you go with me w- to that story, it's not just 2,000 years ago. It's 2,900 years ago. It's back to the time of the kings, after David and before the exile, the time in which the prophet Elijah lived, as we heard read for us this morning from 1 Kings chapter 18. 
And here the story goes that there is a new king that rules the northern kingdom. And that new king's name is Ahaz. And Ahaz, in the way that he lives his life, in the way that he structures his government, in the way he guides the people of Israel, th- it, the scripture says that of all the evil deeds of all the kings that went before him, none of them compared to those that were done by Ahaz. That he angered the Lord. It was a grave disappointment. You know, the people, the Hebrew people were a people who had been led out of the wilderness, who had been drawn to a promised land, had been delivered from slavery. There was so much reason, so many experiences they had had to trust and rely on God. And yet, in that day, their leader not only discouraged it, but made it illegal and, and went to such an extent to execute those who were priests and prophets of God's word. Uh, part of that journey for Ahaz was that he married a woman named Jezebel. Now, okay, so here's the problem. Now, some of you have been in this church for a little while, and you know that whenever I mention Jezebel, I've never told this story, by the way, that we're about to get into, but nevertheless, it involves Jezebel, and whenever we talk about Jezebel, we always go, right? right. So uh, Ahab marries this woman named Jezebel. They're very good, very good. Uh, And the problem is, she's has a different faith tradition. And while that may be fine, it, lots of kings married others, they, they were still invited to, to come to the faith of the one true God and to worship that and let that preside. Instead, she goes, no, 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 no. I can't stand this worship of your uh, almighty God, uh, this Lord who's done all these things. Instead, worship my gods and my goddesses. And so she invites Ahaz to worship Baal, or B-A-A-L in, in English translation, otherwise pronounced Baal or Baal. And also the goddess Asherah. And the way you, by the way, Baal was a god of fertility. In fact, they both were. Baal was a god of fertility of the crops. And um, he was known as the, as the god of the rain and the dew. The god of the rain and the dew would bring forth the crops. And Asherah was a goddess. Um, and she was worshipped with a pillar, and she was a goddess of human fertility. And so she was worshipped in a number of ways. And she, uh, they, uh, Jezebel's influence, yeah, I'm getting right about you there. Yeah, 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 come on, got to stay with me. Jezebel's influence over Ahaz was to not only get him to turn away from God, but to turn everybody else away from God as much as they could. And so they go forth uh, a policy of annihilation of the priests and the prophets of Israel. And they killed them. One after the hundreds of them are murdered. Uh, a guy named Obadiah, who is not the later prophet, he's the manager of the king's household. He, he tries to secure some of their lives. He, he was able to secure the, the life of a hundred of those prophets. He takes them in two different caves and brings them food and water and, and ensures their safety as much as he, at a threat of his own life. The one great prophet that survived was a guy named Elijah. And Elijah goes off to another region, and he hides in a cave all on his own. And God tells him that before he should go, he should pronounce a judgment over Ahaz and Jezebel. There, okay. And, and over, over Israel, and say, for as long as he's gone, there shall be no rain and no dew. Ooh, notice the words there, right? The very things that Baal was supposed to be the Lord over. There shall be no rain and there shall be no dew. And for year... After a year, there was no rain and there was no dew. There was a great drought that occurred in Israel for two years. And finally, on the third year, God comes to, to Elijah and says, it's time to return. I want you to go back. And, you know, this is for the whole time, this whole three-year period, the one person that Ahaz wanted to kill the most uh, was Elijah. And he, he had been hiring people to do so. And so he's on his way back, and as he's on his way back, well, the king and Obadiah go out to care for some of the flocks. And Obadiah is out there, and he sees Elijah walk towards him. And he's, you're alive? And he falls down on his knees. He's like, praise God, the great prophet Elijah still lives. I'm so grateful to see you. He embraces him, and he says, I- I've tried to secure the life of others. I'm so glad to see you're alive. And, and, and Elijah interrupts him and says, I want you to go back to the king. I want you to tell him I, I live. And then I'm coming. <laughs> and nobody goes, why are you doing this to me? See, this is what happens. He even goes and tells it. He says, everybody who's ever tried to say, I, I think I saw Elijah over here, or I saw Elijah over there, whenever they get back, you're not in that place. And those people 
So they, they get executed. I mean, they were, you know, and the whole time, by the way, they were wrong because Elijah wasn't in any of those places. But they were giving the king hope that he could kill him. And he goes, if you send me back and you move somewhere else or the spirit of the Lord takes you away, then I will be put to death. And Elijah goes, I promise you, you can trust me. I will be where I say I am going. Go and get the king. And so the king comes. And when he comes, he doesn't just come by himself. But Ahab, he brings he brings the prophets of Baal and Asherah. How many are there? I'm glad you asked. The, re- the, the number, uh, there's 450 for Baal and 400 for Asherah. So 950 against. And he's like, we're going to take you out. And, and, and we have the very first words he says to Elijah are, is it you troubler of Israel? And Elijah goes, I'm not the troubler. You're the one who has, who has attacked God's holy word, who led the people in unholy ways. Who, who, had, who tries to kill prophets of the Almighty, I'm not the one who's troubling Israel. It is you. And, and with this, Ahab, um, he, he brings everybody up to Mount Carmel, and Elijah invites the people to come near, and Elijah speaks to the prophets of Baal and Asherah, but also to the crowd that's gathered to witness what could be a great and mighty battle between one <laughs> and 950. And, and Elijah says, Come, come near. He says, how long will you go limping with two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. Then the people, they did not answer. And Elijah said to them, I, even I alone, uh, alone am alive, left a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets number 450. Let two bulls be given to us. So what, what Elijah does is he sets up kind of uh, a duel between Baal and Asherah and, and the Lord God Almighty. And this is what he says. He says, okay, I want two bulls, right, lots of meat, and you're going to have a sacrifice towards them. Uh, and, and what uh, he says to the prophets of Baal and to Ahab is build an altar, uh, build a fire, create a fire pit, uh, and then put the wood on it, put the meat on there, and then if your God is Almighty, pray that the spark would come and it would catch on fire. And it would consume, and you would see an evidence of the miraculous power of your ball and your Asherah. And he goes, and then afterwards, God, a shot. And so they do. And, and the prophets of Baal, they, they build the, the wood, they stack it together. I don't know if they use teepee method or log cabin. I mean, do you have a preference? Uh, uh, teepee, raise your hand if you're a teepee. Just sign. Uh, raise your hand if you're a log cabin. I think you should start with TP and move the log cabin. That's my own opinion. Um, just saying, I don't know. It doesn't tell us how they built the log cabin or the, what the TP, but, but they build this thing, and then they put the meat on top, and then they're like, and Elijah's like, okay, go ahead and start your prayers or whatever you're going to do to see the miraculous power of this God that you've given up the Lord for. Right? You've chosen this other thing. Let's see its power. And so the people, they start praying, and they start chanting, and they start dancing, and they're dancing around it, and they're dancing around it, and morning gets later and later. Hours go by, and finally it becomes noon. And this is funny. This is when Elijah speaks up, and he goes, um, but there was no voice, it says, and no answer. They limped about the altar that they had made. At noon, Elijah mocked them, saying, cry aloud, louder. Surely he's God. Either he's meditating or he's wandered away. Maybe your God is on a journey or perhaps asleep. And must be, it must be, maybe your God needs to be woken up. Be louder. And so um, they do. They go louder and louder. And then they start uh, in a religious fervor. They start cutting themselves and hoping that the bloodletting will bring about. One of the ways you worship these gods was like human sacrifice, right? Sacrifice of, of virgins and of children. This is what they gave up God for. And so they start cutting themselves, these prophets, and still nothing happens. And then Elijah says in verse 30, he says to the people, come closer to me. Come on in. I love what's happening here. What he's doing is he's going, okay, there's, there's 950 against him. And then he invites the, the congregation, if you will, the community, the, the Hebrew people, to become the prophets and priests of God, to join him, to join him. And so he draws them closer into the fold. And then he prepares the altar, and they build the, the altar, but there's, there's all these stones. See, Ahab had destroyed the altar of God, 
And so these stones are laying around, and he takes 12 of them, representing the 12 tribes of Israel, and he stacks them, or he makes a circle, you know, like you would, to build a, a fire pit. If you don't have a solar stove, you need to stack the bricks or the stones around in a circle, and they do that. And then they put the wood on top and, and within. And then he put the meat of from that bull on it, just as the people who had been following Baal did. And then he goes, I want a trench around the whole thing. By the way, it's always good to have water nearby and to have some distance, right? You don't want to, everybody get up close, you know, let's light it up. You know, to just get some distance before, you know, have one person closer. And he goes, I, I want a, a trench all around the whole thing. This is what God told him to do. And then take four buckets of water. And he says, pour them on top. Now, if you ever lit a fire in the rain, you know how hard that is. You don't want your wood damp in the least. If it is, you, you would maybe peel away the bark so you can get to dry wood underneath of it, maybe shave some of that so it becomes tender and kindling so that you can light it more easily. But he says, no, none of that, none of that. Pour four, all four buckets on top of the, the wood. Then he goes, fill them up again, do it again. Then he come back with four more buckets, and they pour eight buckets now of water on top of the wood, the altar, the meat, everything, pouring into the trough. He goes, do it a third time. I like to think of that as like for the Holy Spirit. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Levels of buckets being poured. And they pour the, the water on again. Twelve buckets of water poured on top. And then just once, just once, Elijah asked. It says there in verse 36, the prophet Elijah came near and says, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are the God of Israel, and that I am your servant, and that all that I have done I have done all these things at your bidding. Answer me, O Lord, answer me. So this people may know that you, O Lord, are God. And that you have turned their hearts back. Then it says in verse 38, Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offerings, the wood, the stones, the dust. It even licked up the water that was in the trench. I love this story. First of all, fire. Praise God, right? It's not easy to always light a fire. My solo stove, I can't really, I need, I need one of those things to go down in there, help it, you know. I get lazy. I use the, the fuel log, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. It's okay. This is a no judgment zone when it comes to your own fire pits and stuff like that. But Elijah doesn't need any of that. The Lord doesn't require any assistance. The Lord is the Almighty. The Lord is the one who doesn't need any of us, but loves us so much to invite us into the dynamic with God for our well-being, for our salvation, right? And so he utilizes Elijah, one who's willing to follow and build the fire, who's heard the instructions and is following through. Persist in trusting God and thereby enabling the miracles of God to be witnessed by others, right? And so he invites them forward, and the fire consumed, and the people look at these prophets, and these prophets just take off, <laughs> and the people go after them. It's not good. What happens next? But anyway, it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a way in which the people came back to God, if you will. And Ahab and Jezebel are put right, right? They're reminded of the power of God and how important it is to turn to that. Now, um, when you build your fire— you should start with the smallest amount, the smallest things, right? You need to have a little bit of tinder. Some, maybe you use some paper or, or you use some, some, something small, maybe the inside of the bark, the, the fur of that, right? And you want to take it and you want to roll it together, break up the fibrous nature of it so it lights more easily. Um, and then on t but if you have that and you light that, right, you, you get that there and, and you put it there and then you, you light it there, it catches on fire, that's great, but then it's going to go out quickly. What do you need to do next? You need to have more wood at the ready, right? What kind of size wood? This size, right? You keep building up. You go from the little tiny fibers to this size wood, to this size wood, to this size wood, to this size wood, right? From tinder to kindling to main logs. What happens if you try to light it with... Oh, nah, it ain't going to work. Not unless you've got a miracle like, you know, like fuel that you're pouring on top. It's a dangerous thing. No, no, you need to start small, you need to build up from that. The reason we're talking about this today is because God is inviting us into the light of the Lord. And, he, and God is willing and capable of doing miracles in our lives. But God wants us to utilize the, the resources that we have 
the, the opportunities, the relationships, the, all the things that God has given us and say, look, these are mechanisms for the miracles of God to take place in your life. Utilize them to the glory of God. Trust God. Don't, don't be worshiping other things that, that are taking you away from God. Give up these other philosophies and things that you're beholden to, political perspectives that you would bow to more than you would bow to the word of God. Any number of things. You know, give up that, whatever it is that is not central, that brings life and light into this world. Remind yourself to, to check everything that you're thinking about based upon whether or not it's true to who God is and what God has to- God's word has told you about yourself and about others. You, you are wonderfully and fearfully made. Life has value. The lives of other people, even when they disagree with you, vehemently has value. Build. If you want to see peace in this world, okay, Lord, where, where is it that I'm not utilizing the small logs, a willingness to love of my enemy? That's, maybe that's a big one for you. <laughs> maybe that's huge. God's saying, all right, that's part of the building of this fire. And I, I can ignite it. You may not be able to ignite it, but, but, but we need to use the things that you've got to be able to make that light shine and grow and build that fire. And so, you know, you're sitting there going, well, you know, I, I've got a real problem. My relationship, my, my marriage is not going well. I, I, can't, I can't stand how she is doing this or how he's doing that. And God's going, okay, right, right. So let's start with the small pieces, not the biggest ones. Small pieces are do you show kindness? Do you not them? Do you show mercy? Do you take show effort, extra effort? Do you let them know that that they're heard and that you care about them? These are the small things, right? Now let's build bigger from there. Let's go sh- larger from there. But start with that stuff, and not with the other person. But start with yourself. Start with what you've got. You know, sometimes it looks like the odds are against us, right? There's water poured on top of the building blocks that we have. And it's just bucket after bucket to drench it and not make it light. And yet, God says, oh, I can work with all of that. <laughs> I can work with all of that. You can't douse it with enough liquid that, I, that the Lord can't make a spark and let the fire and the light break. You know, um, Mary, is, she, she is reminded by the prophet that I can do all things that, that – that, that nothing is impossible with God. Nothing is impossible with God. The, the Apostle Paul has a story where he brings in fire in a fire pit notion, and he's talking to his church that he started in Corinth, and in Corinth they're saying, well, you're no longer the pastor here, so we we are with the new guy, and some of them are like, well, we're not with the new guy, we're with you, Paul, and, and other people are like, well, we're with Jesus, and, and Paul steps in and he goes, Paul or Apollos, it's about saying yes to the light of God in this world. Don't you're not making anybody happy by choosing individuals. No individual is God other than Christ Himself. And so he says to them, He goes, Look, think of it this way. I watered, uh, I planted, Apollos watered, God is at the fire. Right? I may have had a role of planting, Apollos had a different role of watering. Now God get, God is the one who provides the growth. In the darkest of nights is when the light shines the brightest. Right? There's a light in the heavens. And it's shining and it's willing to take root in your life and have a new spark. And start taking the necessary steps, putting the pieces together to enable that light to grow and the fire to ignite and help build it. Help build it in the days to come. With faith, maybe that's some prayer. Maybe that's starting to read the Bible. You know what the bu- building blocks are. You know what the tinder and the kindling looks like. But too often we leave them there on the side and we go, Lord, 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 just give us a bigger spark. Give us a bigger one. The Lord is providing the spark. Add to it the fuel that will make it grow. Thanks be to God. Amen.